So, Michael, you've been in Barbados on holiday. I'm the man with a tan, yes. George Hamilton, that's me. <laughs> but while you were there, I went over to Lincoln Center Theater for a meet and greet for Douglas Carter Bean's new play, The Nance. Which stars uh, our old friend Nathan Lane. Now, Susan, I do want to say, though, we've been trying to get Nathan on the show a long, long time because he's a huge fan of mine, as you well know. I know, because you've written such lovely things about him in your column. And I'm a little put out that when I'm away, you sneak around behind my back to get that Nathan Lane interview. Did you invite Nathan on the show to meet me at some point? Uh, yes. And what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen? <laughs> I, 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 they didn't say yes. Nathan, All right. if you're watching, you have a standing invitation to come on Theater Talk. We'll have a nice conversation. You know I'm a big fan of yours. So now we take you to the <laughs> rehearsal hall. We looked at the props. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed it. it sounds exciting. It was fabulous. And then we started out our interviews by talking to, as you said, Nathan Lane. Hi. Susan, cheer up. I know. You too. A, a vision, you too, Nathan. A vision in black. <laughs> That's all I can pull together. I'm what sorry. time did you get up this morning? I got up at 8:30. So, and and when you when you woke up, then you thought, I have to go to a meet and greet. Mm. What was your thought on this? Well, I know. It, you know, I just want to rehearse, really. Yes. Yeah, so you know, because you get to talk to all the press today. Mm. Do you do you welcome that opportunity? Well, no, 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 nobody does. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to break it to you. Maybe, uh, who? <laughs> Maybe Scarlett Johansson. No, no. Maybe she's really upbeat about this kind of thing, but having done <laughs> it for a long time, no, no, you don't want to talk about your work. You just want to do it. You want to rehearse. Plus, they're a bunch of animals anyway, you know. Well, I don't, I, you know, that's I, their business. I'm, well, I'm, that's very you true. Know, but no, no, I don't, you know. I, you know, I'm being honest with you. I want you to be honest. But with perhaps you. I shouldn't be, but no, maybe you're not honest with me. No, What's I did not point? jump out of bed this morning saying, "Oh boy, I get to meet the press today <laughs> no, I and have it. chats about the play." <laughs> no, so speaking of the play, yeah, I, I, I heard you say you're playing the. I had never heard this term, the Nance, before. Mm -hmm. Is this one you had heard before? Well, if you you probably have heard, uh, you know, uh, in, in English slang, a uh, uh, Nancy boy. Yes, of course, I've heard that, heard that many a time. So, um, a Nance was just a, a character in, in burlesque sketches that was a you know, very effeminate stereotype of a yeah. gay man. Can you can you think of like famous Nances of yesteryear that we would know? Not from burlesque. Not from burlesque. Um, I don't think any of them became really famous. I mean, uh, I mean, certainly in the in the in the twenties and thirties, every once in a while, uh, a gay character would pop up. Like and Franklin go, Pangborn. Yes, I mean that's the one everyone points to. Uh, he, although I don't. I, I know he lived uh, lived with his mother for many years, so <laughs> I'm sure he probably was gay. But um, you know, I don't think of him so much that way. But he did play that kind of, uh, I guess, what people would call a fuss budget. But he was very prissy, you know. So I guess he falls into that category. But now I'm told that your character is also a Republican. Yes, he is. Uh, Chauncey Miles is a Republican and a conservative. He loves politics. He's He's, he's a big fan of LaGuardia, who in the play is trying to put an end to burlesque. And, um, and he, oh, he hates Roosevelt. He thinks Roosevelt is a socialist. He's always saying, well, you know, what did I ever get? What yeah. did, what, who's, who, when, when do I get my hand out? You know, he's, he's, he's had to create everything for himself, his life, his persona. You know, I would venture to say even his name is something that he made up for show business. Yeah. And I think it, and, and um, at the heart of the play is this love story. I mean, that's what it really is about. Yeah. Oh, right. And what you see is uh, Chauncey, which is one generation, and then in the, in the character of Ned, played by um, this wonderful young actor, Johnny Orsini, you're seeing the next generation, where they're going. Yeah. And they come together and, in a surprising way, and it's very, very touching. And, but ultimately, you know, the tragedy of the play is he can't allow himself... He can't accept this love that he's getting. He can't allow himself to have it, you know, because of his own issues and self-loathing, and he just can't, you know. And so, and that, and, and that I think certainly, I think that's something everyone can relate I to. I think everyone can relate to that. Now, I just want to ask you one more thing. Right. You were in Chicago. You did the Iceman. Yeah. Cometh. yeah. Um, what did that give you as an acting experience? Well, it was just the best acting experience of my my life. Now, how so? Well, I mean, you know, you got an hour. Um, yeah, right, right. You know, right. it's, um, it was just, a, it, the play is, because it's a monumental play, because it's a play I've always wanted to do and have loved since I was a kid, 
Um, and the, the and I was working with Bob Falls and, and a very old friend of mine, Brian Dennehy, who I've known for over 30 years, and, and we've never worked together. And it was just doing it in Chicago, a city I love, and with this great company of actors, it was the most thrilling experience of my theatrical life. And it was uh, the play, obviously the play asks uh, everything of you, you know, to go to the darkest of places. And, and it was, it was, you know, terrifying and thrilling. And it was, you know, it was just the best thing that I could have done for myself as an actor. How are you, darling? Doing great. How are you, my love? So now, if you are, you you must be in, still in a world from your Cinderella. Opening. I'm in my little my little <laughs> yes. I'm in a William Ivy Long designed world. It's going great. If you had to be me, this would be the period to do it. I was there's, now the nails. Yes. What inspired this play? Um, I I have to thank Philip at the Sundance Institute for Playwrights. He got it into his head. He called me. I was in the process of adopting my first child. And he called me and said, we have a U-Cross Foundation in Wyoming where we send you for three weeks, put you in a cab, and feed you, and you have to come back with something. Sort of a writer's retreat in Excelsior. And I said, oh, I can't do that. I'm about to do it. He goes, trust me, you're not going to be doing it for 18 years. Do it now. So I left, and I packed into my little bag a book that I had just picked up called Gay Life by George Chauncey, which is about gay life in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And in my computer, two weekends before, I had done a benefit for my theater company drama department where I did comedy sketches. And I'd been to Lincoln Center Library going over comedy sketches, sorting them out, and had written my versions of those comedy sketches. And in that, had heard the name Nance. Not really making a big connection of it, but as we got into rehearsal, I went, oh my gosh, this is the gay character. It's like the gay equivalent of blackface. This is like the big effeminate queen. We got Brian Bat to play it at the benefit. He was spectacular. Um, so I went off to, you know, I was there amongst the fracking and the and the and the <laughs> mooing and, and the steeds as they went in the Wyoming cowboy boots riding. And I wrote the first scene. And when I was done with the first scene, I realized it was for Nathan. What's a prototype of a dance that we would know from yesteryear? I'm from yesteryear. Well, I'm thinking like if you for if you grew up in the '60s or '70s, it would be a Paul Lind yes. and Alan Seuss or oh, Charles God. Nelson Reilly. Kind of it's very queeny, usually efficient. In the, there are lots of them in '30s and '40s movies. Do you the, think that the dance will uh, that this kind of character will now become obsolete now that they're well, we're on the precipice well, of gay civil rights? Mm -hmm. I think that it's a very interesting companion to gay civil rights about how we view gay people, how we view gay people, how view people gay themselves because of the images that they themselves are involved in creating in society. I love saying like, okay, why do we laugh so hard at this stuff? And it is funny. I mean, it is, there's nothing makes me laugh harder than seeing a big Nelly Queen show up in a sketch. Or but in you a, always do think that he's a tormented soul. <laughs> I, mean, you I, do. I just was really fascinated who the person was off stage. And so I, I wrote him. Here was this play. I've never done, I've never seen anything like it. First of all, it's historically right. It's rich. It's 1937. There's a lot about it that we, even in the modern days, don't know. I mean, I have a lot of you know, gay friends who would have no idea how difficult it was to be gay in the 30s, that it was dangerous, that you could be arrested, that you were marginalized, so there's that. Then there's Nathan Lane at the top of his game. Indeed. And he is doing the original, some of them are ad adaptations, but the original material from burlesque. These are wow. the, the sketches. So he's hilariously funny, and then he breaks your heart because the, the play is filleted between real scenes about his relationship and the backstage life and the political life of the time, which is really interesting, and these burlesque scenes. So it's, it's like this all, it's unbelievable. What do you see now as your greatest responsibility as the director right now to this production? Just to keep everybody in the same world, to sort of keep it moving, uh, to try to, I mean, it's a rich, rich mix, because it's hilariously funny, it has music, and it's heartbreaking. And I don't want it to be a musical that has it sort of diminishes. It's a play about this guy and what politically, emotionally, and theatrically happens to him. And I got to wrap it in that kind of paper. What are you learning from Jack O'Brien? Jack? Yeah. 
Well, I told him, so one of the things I did growing up was, was skateboarding, and my favorite skateboarders were always the people who just seemed effortless and flow in their movements, and Jack does that as a director, and I don't really know how, but he, he brings you to places you didn't even realize you can go, and then you, you're there, and you don't even, you're like, how did I get here? And then you just look at him, and he's just like this Buddha sitting there, and he just, he's, he's unbelievable. Does he talk a lot in rehearsal, or really just um, sparely? It depends. I mean, he talks when it's necessary, and he also knows exactly when to give space. Now, what about Nathan? What are you learning from Nathan? Nathan is so supportive, and he is one of the hardest working people I've ever met in my life. And watching him work on the burlesque sketches, for example, he is just... Um, he has this rich comedic history, like he has clearly studied and he just knows these things inside and out. And the way he and Jack work together to put together these sketches is just, it's amazing to see how the comedic beats come together. And then in the scenes that we have, the love story, the dramatic arc of the story, he, he just works so hard and he has such a richness inside of him. And I, I feel really uh, honored to be working with him. He's, he's great. Well, I have to give you up now. Goodbye, nice. darling. It's very nice to meet you. It's great to meet you now too. Now remember theater talk. Theater talk. You know, it's, it's in the middle of the night, but if you know when you can't sleep, turn it on. Sure. It's likely to be there. Cool. Right. That sounds good to me. <laughs> if, I, if I can see you, I will watch all it. Right. I okay. love that. Goodbye. Well, thank you so much. My following is all very top drawer intelligent. They're pansies, Chauncey. Now somehow the word is out that you're a pansy in real life. So all the pansies are coming to have a fun time and not believe what you just said. And then when the girls come out, they go to the balcony. I have no control over what goes on in the balcony. Disgusting perverts taking care of regular guys who happen to get excited by our girls. Is that what's going on in the balcony? <laughs> so don't let the pansies in then. <laughs> what are you, nuts? We ain't seen money like this since Gypsy Rose Lee played.